Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 317 for Monday, September 6th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here, still here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. <laughs> I, I didn't see you in Napomo, Mr. Kent, but I did see you in uh, in San Jose last week. That was week. so nice. It, it's been a while. How long since we've actually seen each other? I mean, it's probably been... I don't know, two, probably three, three years, two or three yeah. years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. It's, I mean, it's certainly been since, you know, the pandemic began and, and probably six or eight months before that. So yeah, yeah. No, that was great. It, you know, it's one of those things I'm, I, I knew you were coming, but still I'm playing. And then all of a sudden that familiar face and his beautiful wife starts kind of wafting closer to me. I'm like, ah, <laughs> my buddy's here. Yeah. It was, um, it was a serendipitous thing. So I was out, uh, I flew out, we took last week off cause I flew out to, Portland to drop my Portland, Oregon to drop my son off at college. And when we were planning the trip, my wife and I, we, we wound up only being, there's an Airbnb in Portland. We love to stay in and we stayed there, but they were, they weren't available for the full time that we would have wanted to be away after we dropped our son off. You know, we, we liked this idea of having a little bit of empty nester time, you know, and, and uh, we did it in Portland last year and it was fine. There's a lot of hiking to do, you know, it was a good thing to do in pandemic days and, um, so we were like, Oh crap, we can't stay. And so we sort of left the end of the trip open-ended and thought, well, maybe we'll drive up to Seattle. Like just cause the Airbnb is not available. We don't have to go home. And then I was, you know, this is late spring, early summer. I was looking at the fish touring schedule and realized they were going to be in Tahoe right after we dropped off our son at school. It was like, Hey, maybe instead of Seattle, we go down to Tahoe again and, and check out those shows. Unfortunately. So that was our plan, but you know, booked everything, bought the tickets, all the good stuff. Unfortunately, the Caldor fires um, have left a huge impact on Tahoe, and it's it's not a good scene there. It certainly wasn't last week, and um, and so uh, we knew when we were leaving for Portland that we were not going to be going to Tahoe. Like there was just no way these shows were going to happen. But we didn't know what was going to happen. We kind of figured the shows would be canceled. But there was this rumor floating that they were going to relocate the shows. That to me seemed like far too many logistical gymnastics to be realistic. And yet when our plan landed in Portland, uh, I turned on my phone and saw the, all the messages coming in saying uh, shows have been relocated to Shoreline in Mountain View, California. And I was like, oh, holy crap. I've, always, I've heard about that venue. I'd love to go there. And of course, tickets were honored. So it was a quick little it took, you know, a very minor amount of logistical gymnastics on our own to reschedule flights and book a new hotel. But um, but that put me in an area where I know lots of people, including you. So it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it's great to see you again. I will give you another public apology. So, you know, I borrowed a cajon hoping you were going to sit in with me. And uh, when I packed up my car for this acoustic gig, you know, it's a sound system, a couple of guitars, a couple sure. of things. I, the the cajon was sitting there, you know, smiling at me. And Not I part of your routine. Quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Threw me off. So, um, but I'm glad. But then, you know, I, what I love is that we've made these connections together. Uh, you know, you and Simon from my band, Simon's from New Hampshire. He, you yep. met him and you did a gig with him in New Hampshire one time, which was actually really cool. Yeah, I now played, you know him. I played, um, I mean, I played with him the first time I played with him was with, with the house rockers. I think when I sat in and I, I think I'd gotten to know him before that, just coming to house rocker gigs. But then, yeah, yeah he texted me when he was coming to New Hampshire and, and, uh, he was like, Hey man, you know, can I, I want to play a gig. You want to do it with me? And it was like, yeah, of course. So we did a kind of a rock and, you know, up, up beat acoustic kind of thing for a, sure. a graduation party out here, which was great. So yeah, it was good. I love it. Yep. Yeah. I love yep. it. So you, you went up the street and uh, you sat in with uh, Simon's combo, which he affectionately calls the bro show. You are bro, now a bro bro. And, bro and company or whatever it is. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He had a, he had a, you know, kind of the same thing that we did when he played out here. He, he had this, he has this sort of upbeat, you know, up-tempo acoustic kind of rocking thing where it's him and usually somebody playing percussion and usually his brother playing guitar and, uh, along with Simon playing guitar. And, uh, so, you know, I mean, that's, that's what we do in monkey fist all day long. So he was like, Hey, want to sit in? I was like, yeah, this is old hat. 
The funny yeah. part was, you know, that gig out here was his first, really his first like gig as a band leader, right? You, you know, yeah. at least in a long time. And he, I, I'll never forget. It's really funny. And I'm sure he remembered this too, which is why he did what he did. But uh, I'll never forget, you know, he came out and he was scared and he, you know, he's like, we got to make sure this works. I'm like, yeah, it's going to be fine, man. You know, and I, I brought the sound system. Everything was good. And, uh, and I know how talented he is, right? Like I, I, I didn't know that he, this was a first for him. Right. I didn't know that he was nervous or anything. And, and, but then when, you know, we got there and he was like, okay, well, uh, you know, I only sing these songs. We do it this way. And it's like, yeah, okay, fine. So whatever. Great. It's going to be great time. And like, it's low key gig anyway. And, um, and then uh, for whatever reason, take it easy came up in the set list. He's like, you sing lead on this, right? I'm like, no, you sing the lead. We've been singing harmonies all day at that point. We'd already figured like the three of us, him and Amy and I, uh, like we, Amy, a friend of his from New Hampshire that played the, yeah. you know, the three of us played the gig together. The three of us, I mean, within the first half of the first song found our way harmonically. And it was just, that was it. We were off to the races. Like every song had these three part harmonies that were just blowing us all away. And um, it was a true pleasure. And so when he said, you sing, take it easy. I'm like, no, man, it's going to be better if we, if you sing the lead. And he did, but this was not part of the plan. Right. Like, and so yeah. he was, and so I went and sat, you know, so now fast forward three years or whatever it is. And he's been doing a bunch of these gigs and he's like the, the most, he's such a great band leader. He's a great front man. He's like totally comfortable working the crowd and working the band and making everybody feel involved and all that stuff. And, and uh, his drummer, Don Frank, very, very graciously invited me to to come and sit in. And so the first song I played with him, he looked at me. He's like, how about take it easy? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's funny. Uh, and so uh, I, he obviously sang it and, um, and, you know, we played along and, and had fun. And, and I played a few more songs with him after we finished our dinner. And it was a great night. It was a really fun, you know, it was like having dinner with, with old friends is, is yeah. because that's kind of what it was. They were, you know, they were playing and we were, we were, Lisa and I were for the most part sitting there eating, eating and, um, it was great. Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a yeah. good night. No, it's good. I, yeah. You know, I'll just say, you know, Simon, I love him to death. He is he is one of the greatest bandmates I've ever had. He's he's thoughtful. He's you know prepared. He's prompt. He's he's you know he's just great to play with. Yep. And uh, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, when and when COVID took house rocker gigs away, is really when he started doing you know aggressively seeking out these these acoustic gigs. And he does some solo. He does, you know, he yeah. doesn't, he does a great job with it. But, you know, he, he, what he really likes is having a small combo together. He does have, his brother will play acoustic off most of the time. Yeah. Don Frank, who's, you know, kind of a Bay Area, very, uh, played with Ronnie Montrose, played with the Doobie Brothers. I mean, you know, Don is the real deal. Yeah. But I want to take a minute and, and first of all, again, thank Don for inviting me to sit in. I never ask when I go to see friends bands, you know, because I, I know what that's like. It's weird, yeah. it, you know, but he, he almost insisted he, and he's such a nice guy, but really on top of that, he's such a fantastic player. His feel, yeah. his time was just <laughs> like, Oh my God. Like, I mean, most, most drummers that you go see can keep decent time. Like, but, but when you come across somebody like Don, it it's special. Like he really has it together. I mean, he, I, I and I say he has it together. Like he's some, you know, kid starting out. Like, of course he has it together, but it like he, he really blew me away. Really. Blew well, me I'll away. tell you a funny yeah. story. So, so uh, I had the pleasure of having Don play with me in a little winery band. I had, mm. you know, for a while that was just kind of a pickup thing and, you know, knew him to be great. I was introduced to him by a buddy who did a um, Fogarty tribute. And that's the first time I get to play with him. Sure. But, um, we had a weekend where Russ couldn't play house rocker gigs. And I asked Don if he wanted to do it. And he said, yeah. And so we sent him some stuff to prep. And interestingly, the, the first of the two gigs, um, he was feeling his way through and he, he, sure. uh, you know, again, time was never an issue, all those types of things, but you know, we wanted him to cut loose. We, we said, you know, go for it, man, play. And the next day, you know, we were kind of like, like, you know, good player, you know, we'll get through the gig, you know, it's a sub thing. Sure. Dude, he let loose. <laughs> he was absolutely the star of the show. I mean, everybody in attendance that day watching the House Rockers play was just blown away. Not only, you know, again, time is great, but the unique things that he can do as a yeah. drummer, 
Yeah. And some of the, you know, some of the ways that he would fill space or not fill space were just unfreaking believable. And across the band, I mean, everything, you know, like you've done it. It's not terribly easy to sit in with our band. Some of the things we have a couple of things you got to really pay attention to, sure. you know, yeah. sp- ten, 10 guys spaces at a, is at a premium. He, I mean, literally, it was one of those things where you have a sub. Like you did, actually, it was like this when you said in with us as well. We've been very blessed to be careful about who we choose to, to, uh, to be able to on the rare occasions that we need a sub drummer. Yeah. So you know, but but Don owned that show. It was two years ago on a Sunday. That's actually, awesome. coming up two years ago. Yeah. So hats off to Don Frank. He's an absolute gem. On top of everything we're saying about his drumming. Probably one of the nicest guys you could ever meet. Uh, yeah, in he's life. definitely a nicer guy than me. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he really. He, what a, it was. Yeah, it was so, so much fun just getting to meet him and, and play with everybody and all that stuff. So yeah, no, well, good. it was good. Hey, I want to take a minute, and I, I don't want to have a moment of silence for Charlie Watts. I, I want to have a moment of talking about Charlie Watts. Yeah. He he left us with enough silence. So, um, but it, you know, I. I posted something. There was a a great little moment that happened at the Toronto benefit, the benefit that happened in Toronto for SARS. Um, And this was, you know, 10 years ago or so. Both the Rolling Stones and Rush played at this. And just as Rush is going on stage, Charlie comes up uh, to Neil Peart and introduces himself. Neil's kind of Neil told the story in one of his books, uh, which was f- funny to hear. But, you know, at first he he had no idea that he was in like show mode. They were like literally a minute from going on. You know, he's putting his ears in, standing at the side of the stage, like just getting ready for, you know, for somebody to point him towards his drum stool. And this guy comes up and starts to introduce and, you know, and, and then finally, of course, Neil realizes who it was. And I posted about this story because I said, wow, you know, here, here we have two legends and now they're both gone. And, uh, Somebody commented and said, um, you know, if, if Neil Peart came up to me at a gig, I wouldn't, I, I, I would ask him, you know, where the, where the bathroom was or something. He's like, but if Charlie Watts came up to me at a gig, I'd know who he was sort of reversing the story. And it made me, it, it gave me a thought. It was like, man, what a, there's so many people I, and I have seen it happen on both sides of the spectrum because these guys are, were two very, very different drummers, uh, in terms of, you know, how they played and how they filled space or didn't fill space, um, you know, and, and Neil, of course, played a whole lot more notes uh, probably in his life than Charlie did. But they were both fantastic drummers. And for people who dismiss, well, either one of them, but I want to talk about Charlie. For people who dismiss Charlie Watts because of his seemingly simplistic playing, I I encourage you to take the time to listen and get to know the material and and his feel and how he really accomplished what he did because I don't think the stones could have happened without Charlie. He you know he he's a jazz drummer, right? Hit the stones were his day gig. That was his as as is often called in the pro industry the house gig, right? The gig that pays for your house. Um, but, but it wasn't his passion. Not, not that he didn't enjoy it. Right. You know, he, I think what did, what did he say? He says, I've gotten, uh, I, I, I feel like I've gotten more from rock and roll than I've given to it. Uh, you know, but, uh, but he gave so much to rock. I, I disagree with that statement. I, I think it's, uh, but who cares about it? I mean, you know, why is simplicity a, a bad thing? You know? Well, I think it's that I, I don't think it's that it's a bad thing. I think that it's easy to overlook Charlie like it's like it's easy to overlook Ringo and say, well, I mean, all they did was play time like they didn't do anything. You know, Char- Charlie just sat back and played and 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 didn't you know, he wasn't ever the star of the show, <laughs> except he was always the star of the show. Uh, right? Absolutely. Right, you know, and, and so it's it's not always about how much, you know, how many notes you can fit in. I mean, certainly, you know, I, I grew up on prog rock. Neil Peart was, you know, one of my big, you know, drumming influences. I, I, there is plenty of room for that. Like, I, and, and thank goodness for that. But there's also plenty of room for what Charlie did in the stones. And, um, and I, I, I encourage everybody to listen to it. The, the if you ever wanted a great example of linear playing, you know, Charlie, was the first one that showed it. David Garibaldi sort of took it in and went in a different direction as have many other drummers. 
But, you know, linear playing, meaning you're not playing, you're, you're only hitting one hand at a time and sometimes only one limb at a time. Uh, you know, that Charlie thing, try that sometimes, drummers. You know, yeah. instead of playing straight eighths on the hi-hat and hitting two and four on the snare, play, you know, play only one eighth note, you know, one beat, one hand per eighth note and and leave one open for the snare. And, and then, and do that for like an hour with a click track. And maybe, just maybe, at some moment, you'll get into the zone and it'll actually feel comfortable. And that little moment is what ch is where Charlie Watts lived his whole life. Yeah. And, and, and he was like, he not only made himself, he not only himself was comfortable playing that way and just leaving so much room for that backbeat that he made everybody else super comfortable with it. And that was the key to the Stones groove. But well, a reinvention of pocket, right? I mean, just there's, yeah. there is no pocket like the Stones pocket. No, but also then go listen to 19th Nervous Breakdown. And I challenge any drummer out there to play that song, that drum part, the way Charlie played it. It's it's really easy to, to, to overlook. But but the whole part is this like swung fast, swung eighths on the ride cymbal. Da ding, da ding, da ding, da ding, da ding. But faster than that, right? And then two and four on the snare. It sounds like just a straight ahead rocker because that's what the rest of the band's doing. But Charlie's got that truly swung, not even like the Ringo sort of half swung eighth notes. Like it's a da ding, da ding, da ding, da ding, shuffly, like super fast shuffle on the ride cymbal going all the way through the tune. And that's what drives the buzz. So... And it's hard. I like. I have a really hard time playing that song the right way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Charlie's way. Yeah. So. So, um, you know, I haven't been able to work a Springsteen reference in for a long time, but uh, <laughs> Springsteen's drummer Max Weinberg wrote a book about drummers, right? Yeah. And and in the forward, Springsteen wrote the forward to it, and his quote is, "As much as Mick's voice, voice, and Keith's guitar, Charlie Watts' snare sound is the Rolling Stones." Yep. When Mick sings, it's only rock and roll, but I like it. Charlie's in the back showing you why. Yeah, it, that's it. That's I, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's a shame to have lost Charlie. It's a pleasure to have lived at the same time he did, uh, or at least some of the same time he did and get to not only experience the music he was making, but but actually experience it live. Uh, I, I consider myself really fortunate to have seen the Stones um, as much as I did. He he always owned it. You know, he seems like such a light hitter and he is not like you cannot. It, it doesn't matter that you have amplification, and all that. You cannot drive a stadium show by being timid on a drum set. Um, you know, I um, it just doesn't happen. Charlie, yeah. Charlie owned every room they played in and it was fantastic. <laughs> Without so. a doubt. What's your favorite Charlie Charlie Watts drum part? Oh man. I mean it it might be God, there's so many that I like for so many different reasons. Like 19th Nervous is is certainly, you know, up there. Uh I I really like Brown Sugar. Uh, you know, the way he sort of made that super tribal kind of thing happen again without adding extra notes, right? He 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 played exactly as much as needed to be played to convey that that groove, but yeah, that brown sugar groove, I like a lot. Um, and, and, you know, the beginning of start me up, that song started as a reggae tune. And as soon as you know that, and you understand one drop reggae, then you can hear why Charlie played on the one with the snare the first time through. Right. right. Cause it's, it's like, Oh, we're going to play this one drop. No, we're not. We're going to play it, you know, straight two four kind of thing. So uh, so I always like that little creativity bit. And I had no idea up until just a few years ago that it originally was, a, you know, kind of conceived as a reggae thing. And then it was like, ah, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's why Charlie did that. Like, that makes a whole lot more sense now, because otherwise it's really screwed up. But I like that. Like, he had that way of saying, here I am, you know, and and he was always there. So I would say, uh, give me shelter. I think there's an ISO oh track of that floating around somewhere where if you just want to hear the drumming and but i would also i i have to say the, the greatest drum intro of all time to me is honky tonk woman well sure yeah yeah i mean right like you know and that's a fun one to play he, charlie didn't do this but that's a fun one to play you know the cowbell and then play the right. the you know the 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 hits that bring it in but that yeah boom, bah, boom right you know yep. like so perfect <laughs> so two perfect. notes and you're in man like <laughs> 
Yep. Hey, uh, if you are not already using Bandzoogle, our sponsor for this week, to manage your band's website, to host your band's web presence, to host your electronic pressed kit. Pressed kit? No, it's just an electronic <laughs> press kit. Now is the time to do that because you get to go to bandzoogle.com. You get to try it free for 30 days and then you get to use our promo gig gab. So there's three G's, only two of them are together. G I G G A B to get 15% off your first year of any subscription. And Banzoogle is amazing because they have all the features you need for a pro website. Then they're already built in. And that includes, you can host, including a custom domain name, which is a really good idea. Dozens of fully custom design templates. So you don't have to, you're not starting from whole cloth. You are choosing from one of their design templates and then you get to customize it. But the cool part is these templates are built to work everywhere in every web browser. Like you don't have to think about that because they've already thought about it. And then they've got all these commission free tool tools. It's true. Like everything they, you can sell your music and merch commission free. You can do your crowdfunding and fan subscriptions commission free. You can do a mailing list and all of that stuff to send newsletters and you get live support from their musician friendly team. Usually musicians themselves, as I've encountered seven days a week. And like I said, because you're a listener to gig gab here, you can go to bandzoogle.com, try it free for 30 days and use the promo code GIGGAB, that's all one word, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Banzoogle.com, promo code GIGGAB, and our thanks to Banzoogle for, well, for sponsoring the episode, but also simply for doing what they do. So thanks, Banzoogle. They, they are awesome. They're proud host of the House Rockers. Oh, nice. That's right. Yep. Of course they are. Yeah, of course. Very cool. All right. We have, um, we have two questions from you all. And I want to start with uh, one from Kevin here. He says, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you may be with Milwaukee Summerfest, which claims to be the world's largest outdoor music festival. It's across 10 days, across multiple stages. And this year, because of COVID, um, it's, they're doing it three consecutive weekends in September instead of 10 days straight. Uh, he says the band play has played every year going back to 2007 and this, this year is no different. The festival announced a couple of weeks ago that anyone attending performer, worker, patron has to either show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test within uh, the three days taken within the three days prior to uh, attending the festival. Uh, so I I'm and he says, uh, is this a sign of things to come? I thought you guys might find it interesting. It's funny. I had this before I saw your email, Kevin. I had this subject on the uh, on the, the the on the agenda for today because I've had an interesting go with this. Um, I don't. I, I'm vaccinated. I'm happy that I was. I, I I got the vaccine as soon as I was able to. I don't like telling our fans what to do. I don't like telling them that they need to sit or that they need to stand or that they need to dance or that they can't dance or that they can't dance with a drink in their hand. And so I've always sort of left that up to the venue. And we have a gig coming up on Saturday night uh, here on September 11th. It's at the, in the barn at a private home and here in, in Durham. And it's uh, it's going to be, it's actually, it, it's a fling organized gig. Um, uh, it's a kind of mostly original focus night. Uh, we have a band called the church ladies that we've played with before. And then a band that fling has never played with before. Bitter pill is also playing this gig. So I'm playing twice uh, in the night and our, our whole it's in their barn. We've done gigs there before and they're always very sort of loosely open to, you know, people they don't know, but are friends or fans of the bands that are attending to come to these things. This time they said, you know, our host said, we, um, we want everybody there to be vaccinated. No testing, no, none of that. And it's all honor system. They don't want anybody checking at the door because it's all friends of, you know, people it's it, realistic to say that the honor system in this sense would work. And, uh, and I was actually, I was more than fine with that. I like that. I, you know, um, but I, as, as fling, I had always, or I had over the last you know few months said, you know, as fling, I don't know that we want to mandate this. Um, I, again, it just going back to, I don't want to tell people how to enjoy our music. Um, we're going to do what we do. You do what you do. And if, yeah. it, if you like it, uh, you know, great, you know, now, I mean, if enjoying our music means that you, you want to, you know, go and, and beat people up. 
okay, well then, you know, we're probably going to ask you not to come to the gigs, right? Like, you know, if your enjoyment impacts someone else's enjo enjoyment, like that, that's where your freedoms, in my opinion, end, right? You know, you, you do you as long as everybody else can do themselves. And I, I've, that's just always kind of how I felt. But I like the idea of playing in a room of vaccinated people. Uh, yeah. The concerts that I saw in Sh at Shoreline in Mountain View in your area or your old area last week uh, were mandatory vaccine or, uh, you know, test within 72 hours prior to the start of the show or something like that. And, and they checked passes on the way in. They were pretty good about it the first night, at least from what I could see, although I heard it got more lax as as more people came in. The second night, they were really tight about it. They sort of revamped their their logistics of getting people in and, and really checking people. In fact, the, one of the guys looked and saw Lisa's birthday on hers and uh, was like, oh, I don't think you, you know, I don't think you qualify. And she's like, yeah, I qualify. And he, she had to kind of point it out. But they were actually paying attention, which was, you know, interesting to see. And I, I definitely liked, uh, as someone who experienced plenty of COVID anxiety, I really liked being in attendance at that event, knowing that, you know, everybody was either tested or vaccinated for the most part. I'm sure there's people that, you know, snuck by the system one way or another, but, but in general, you know, that, that felt like I was more comfortable there for whatever reason. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, this is, is this a sign of things to come? I absolutely think so. Uh, you know, I think certainly more and more venues I'm seeing it around here, uh, are, are starting to mandate this, um, but I'm curious what you think about it from a, a, well, in general, but also just like, would you as, as like, you know, Paul Kent Solo or the House Rockers ever say, we are going to institute a, or would you do that now? I'm, I don't want to put you yeah, in a yeah. position of saying never, because we all get the, the, we all reserve the right to change our minds. And I'm, I'm sort of in that mode. Like, d you know, how, do I feel differently about this than I initially did? Like, which is okay. You know? Well, I think that's the discussion. So my assessment of this is we are right now in um, the next phase of reality of what's going to yeah. happen moving forward. So, so when we, you and I did a year of shows, got any gigs? No, you know, we're waiting it out. You want to stream, <laughs> you know, we did a year like, like, damn, when is this thing going to be over? And I remember my own position was bitterness at musicians who were still going out and, and trying to play somewhere saying you're you're gathering people you're prolonging how this is before vaccines sure of course you know you're you're part of the problem right mm. do you want to be part of the solution or part of the problem i just did a gig that was really crowded and i felt very conflicted about it it was great to play for that many people yep there are no outdoor mask requirements in our county in the, in sure. that county sure right so so you know if 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 you go by the public health officials are driving the bus on this. And certainly in Santa Clara County, they were very, very strict about it. They're, they they were over strict about it. There is not a mask requirement for outdoor events. They encourage people to avoid large crowds, but this was a large crowd. Sure. You know, it was probably three to 5,000 people. Um, uh, I felt very conflicted. And actually within the band, I've got guys we need to have a, an agreement in the band that, you know, how we're going to, how we're going to behave. I said, I believe we should mask until we start performing, try not to go out and mingle with fans, you know, stay backstage before, yeah. do your gig, you know, and get out. And the guys, you know, I saw, you know, they all kind of nodded in agreement or, you know, whatever, but um, you know, it's, that's hard, especially these outdoor gigs, people, yeah. you know, find their way backstage. They want to hug you. They want to say, thank you. You know, all these types of things. I, but that said, we definitely are watching a new reality. You know, I just saw, you know, several bands have canceled. My buddy Brad Maddox was supposed to be out with Stevie Nicks. She canceled her tour. Um, there was a huge festival here called Bottle Rock up in Napa um, that Chris Stapleton pulled out. Uh, yeah. I, I don't, I'm actually not positive if he was a COVID specific reason, but Stevie Nicks was. Um, and we're just kind of watching, you know, there are mask mandates indoors. There, um, you know, again, if you, if you say, I, I would agree in with some you. Places, it's not, not, not everywhere. Right. Okay, like, no, I'm talking about here. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, okay. Most counties here have returned to mask mandates for indoors. Yeah. Um, I will agree with you that at this point in time, so my initial bitterness that, you know, musicians shouldn't be part of the problem sure. and getting out the kind I would be like now public health officials are asserting their 
positions on this, you know, all over the world. And, you know, that's okay. Uh, it's not the band's requirement. I don't have any problem with bands on stage. And certainly we do this telling people, please stay safe. Be, please be cool to each other. Oh, you know, sure. we still, we're not, do- we're not done with this yet. You know, if you feel the need to, you know, to, to preach a little bit, you know, I don't, I don't have a, 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 an essential problem with that. Um, but I do think personally, it's kind of everywhere. So vax mandates are one angle of this. Canceled shows are another angle of this. Oh, yeah. Who has the juice and all this type of stuff? You know, the artist or the or the you know the booking agency, you know, or the tour managers or whatever. You know, it, it's evolving rapidly. There seems to be more of a, I would say, there seems to be more of a of, of velocity towards vax mandates to enjoy indoor music. Certainly, although you just saw outdoor, you know, yeah, the, the fish, it was outdoor. Fish did a, a essentially month long summer tour, maybe month and a half. You know, it's five to six week long tour. I saw him at the very beginning of it when we had to be in Nashville for uh, for podcast movement and these fish shows, and uh, that it, they did basically two legs with maybe you know, a week and a half off in between them. And the first leg, which included when I saw him in Nashville, there were no, you know, there were no mandates of any kind. It was just come on out and enjoy yourselves. Every show was outside for this whole thing. Uh, But as they got to the end of that first leg and were approaching their two week off, you know, uh, period, week and a half off period, they said, okay, we fish are mandating vaccine or negative test for all the shows in the second leg of the tour. Uh, And I think the day they came out with it was exactly two weeks prior to the first of those shows. So I guess, you know, if you hadn't been vaccinated and you wanted to do it that way, instead of getting a test, you could have like tried to go and get the Johnson and Johnson that day, you know, whatever, like, you know, barely enough time, maybe, but certainly tests are fairly easy to get right now. And, uh, and, and they, they, you know, with a negative result, uh, yeah, they'd let you in. So, but, it, but this was, this was not necessarily the venues mandating this, though it may have been driven by that. I don't know, but if certainly, you know, if all the venues say, Hey man, we're going to mandate this, but the, the band did not position it that way at all. It was, we, the fish organization have made this blanket decision across all of these things. And, um, and, and I, and, you know, and, and it was, this was sort of happening at the same time that I started thinking about the September 11th gig and like, Okay, well, it's great that we have this vaccine, you know, mandate for that particular gig. And I was noticing how great I felt about that. And I was like, huh, do do I want to, you know, dance in the waters of being the band that mandates vaccines? And then saw Fish do that. And I was like, okay, well, let's see what the reaction is. Of course, there was, you know, plenty of reaction on both sides of the issue, as you would expect. And it's like, yeah, this is what I kind of want to (laughs) avoid. Is that is exactly that, you know, I, I, we don't, we don't talk politics on this show because I stay like to stay out of that mess for all the same reasons. It's just, it's one of those, I don't want to get into a fight with the people that, uh, you know, that, that we, that, that we, it, you know, to say that, that, you, I mean, you're our audience is true, but I, I see it as so much more than that. I see it as we're all in this together. Paul, you and I are like the stewards of this gig gab community And, but we're all in it and I don't want any of us fighting with each other, but you know, we, so I, so I, I like to just avoid things that aren't about the subject that brought us together in the first place. Right. right? You can avoid it by, by leaving the responsibility of the venue and only playing the venues that support your You could certainly, yeah, that's a little passive aggressive, but, but it's a way to do it for sure. (laughs) (laughs) But it is like, right. Like that's a way to do it is say, Hey, sorry, but, but you know, it, it's, um, I would, I have trouble not being forthcoming and transparent on things like that. Like, you know, saying that we fling would only, and I'm not saying this, like we haven't actually had this discussion in the band, but say, you know, we, a band would, uh, would only play venues with vax requirements. I mean, that, 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 that would be the way to, to do that. And, and I'd be okay with that, but, um, yeah. but yeah, I, yeah. So it, it's been an interesting thing watching, simply watching this evolve and watching my own feelings on this evolve over the last 30 days. And well, the question that we're, we're going around about is like, is it even at our level, even at the you yeah. know glorified weekend where is it our responsibility to preach this stuff? Right. Um, and, you know, you see this all the time. I mean, some I, bands, they feel they've got the stage and they take and they, they extract that responsibility 
And other other bands like, hey, I'm just the entertainer, right? Well, that's I'm hired. It. I, this I'm, is doing, your, I'm doing my job. And this is your two hours to stop thinking about that, right? And and that's that's sort of how I approach it. Is like this isn't this isn't my axe to grind necessarily. Like I, I'm I I don't I don't I don't like seeing bands get on stage with an axe to grind at all, right? Like you, you're you're here to entertain. Like great, entertain. And um and so to to you know to have that there, it was easy for me to say, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be involved in, in doing that to people, but watching my own reactions of, you know, those Nashville shows, I wore a mask for a lot of them. These shows mm. in shoreline, I did not. Um, and I realized, you know, it's all calculated risk. I realized there's nothing, no guarantees on, on either side that, you know, I would have been protected or not protected or, you know, any different, but I, you know, I felt more comfortable wearing a mask in Nashville for more of the time than I certainly did in, uh, at these shoreline shows. So I, you know, noticing that and saying, okay, wait a minute, you know, that mandate actually allowed me to forget about COVID and enjoy the show more. That mm. was sort of right. That like, that was the part of it. Like, well, if my job is to entertain, the first thing I need to do is make people feel comfortable and then I can entertain them. Right. You know? And so it's that, ah, wait a minute. This is not a, a political thing. This is a, you know, if, is this really a thing that, that does make most of the people here, here feel more comfortable? Ah, well, then, uh, wait a minute. Uh, so, let I me flip this around on you a little bit because yeah. um, like this gig we just did on Saturday, there were a lot of people there yeah. and as the pictures are post, the conversations on social media, like you went to that, how many people, how safe could that have been? You know, like, sure. You're always like, going to see that. Yep. Well, you're really going to see it right now. Well, right? that's what so, I mean. Right now you're going to see it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yep. Yeah. So I, I think it's a really, it's a really interesting one. You know, d d you can just speak through your actions. Like I said, only, you know, only choose gigs that, 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 you know, you do have that right. So I, I actually don't think that it's passive aggressive. I think that that's just a viable strategy. If like, if you, your personal belief is I would like to only be part of oh. events that are, that are, you know, promoting good safety and you're going to choose those types of things. I think that's, that's totally viable. I mean, yeah, yeah I was thinking totally of viable. it. The passive aggressive part is more just choosing those venues so that you don't have to look the, the, the decision you've made in the face. Uh, right. Yeah. Fair like, enough. So I, I, I would, yeah, if I were going to do that, I would, I would make it clear. I am, cho you know, we are choosing. You'd own it. Yeah. I'd own it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. But I, you know, it is one of those things. Mike Mendoza was a sax player in my band. Great musician. A working musician teaches during the day, gigs at night, you sure. know, and that's what I mean, right? He said in the middle of the of the thing, he was in no rush for the house rockers to get together to rehearse or no rush for the house rockers to get together and play. He said, you know, in, in our time on this earth, we have not been asked to sacrifice like every other generation has, whether it be war or disease or whatever sure. is going on. You know, so for us to have to just stay home, <laughs> you know, for six months or a year, that is not a big sacrifice. And sure. so he had a he had a fairly deep philosophical perspective. And my point to this is, you know, we're dancing around, you know, the the subjective ethics of what we're doing with regards to COVID and you know that type of thing. Sure. And that's why I'm saying this this phase two, if you want to call it that, of now we're to vax mandates or are we shutting down again or are we, you know, what are we going to do now that we've had a vaccine? We have a vaccine. We have 18 months of history about what's going on. We have a lot of medical data. There's a lot more information than when we started all this, when things shut down, you know, in March of that's absolutely 2020, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it is part of our life. So I, I, I would say that in that, uh, the the hesitancy to make a comment from the stage because it might be considered political isn't that the problem? It's not political. It's science. Well, isn't but, it like but Mike? People don't. I am not a performer of science. I am a performer of music. Now you know. I but he, like for example, I also do a podcast called Mac Geek Gab, right? Where I I teach people and answer people's questions and and true and yes, guide people and share my opinions about you know, using your computers and your technology. I never, I, I'm, I'm, and I would, I, I think it's fair to say I'm an expert on that, right? I yeah. never 
have told people from the stage at a bitter pill or a fling gig, hey, now if you have an iPhone, the best way, th- here's something you should do, right? Like it's the wrong venue for that, even though I'm an expert. I am not an expert at science mm. or politics. So I am definitely not going to get on a stage anywhere and pretend or, or say things that an expert might say on the stage where they are uh, expected to do so. It's just the wrong venue for that. That's my issue with it. I have no problem, uh, you know, when I, don't, I was going to say if, but when an artist, you know, talks about politics or anything else, in, in another venue, right? You know, if in, in an interview or something like that, sure, that's great. But unless it's truly part and parcel of the art that brought them to the stage in the first place. And, you know, you take somebody like Arlo Guthrie or, you know, Bitter Pill. Definitely there's, you know, political leanings. You in, buy a ticket and that's part of what you buy in a ticket. You year. know that that's part of this artist's vibe, but it's not part of my vibe uh it's never been part of fling's vibe and so yeah. it's you an know interesting way to look at it, it my it, wife it, my wife is in that camp to shut up and sing camp. shut up and sing unless, unless your entire audience has has come up knowing you to be someone that preaches and sings or or mm. instructs and sings maybe instruct is a better word right you know so the question is should we be instructing our audiences and the answer is if that's what you do then do that but if that's new Think long and hard about whether that's a thing you want to start I, I adding agree to with your that. show. Yeah, I, I like the way that you said that. I agree with that. I, my instincts, and certainly in this last show, is to go there without going there. And I don't, I don't think it's a cop out, and I don't think it's passive aggressive. But you know, comments like "be cool to each other," "we're going to get through this," you know, that type of thing. Without, without, there's, a, there's some imaginary line somewhere that that my instincts are saying, "stay away from there." Sure, but. It is, you know, I am the person getting them to clap their hands and jump up and down and, yeah. you know, <laughs> that type of thing. I, which there is, which is part be, of your vibe. That's right. You are instructing right. your audience to clap and interact with the music and, and other things that other bands might not do. And that's right. also OK, because people so there, know that a, that's you. Yes, there is there is a sweet spot of encouraging people to interact with our music in a responsible and safe way so that we can do it again (laughs) the next weekend. Sure. Right. Yeah, of course. So yeah, that's what I was saying. My instincts are more like don't preach, but almost feel like an obligation to be like, yes, we are in this incredibly weird scenario. We all know it. It's not the elephant in the room. We all know it. Yeah, no, it's good to acknowledge it for, for it. I think. Yeah. 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 And I guess maybe, you know, follow your instincts, I guess is the fairest Mm -hmm. thing to do. Like, like you said, if you never have had the reputation as a band of, of coming out with positions on things, if you were to start doing that, it could hurt your brand, could make you seem ingenuous. It could make the shut up and sing people get really angry, yeah. you know? So, you know, it, it, you know, there's a risk if it's not, if it's not the way that you do things. That's right. And, and, but flip side, if you are a band that people look to for social satisfaction, which is something a really good band can elevate themselves Absolutely. to, Absolutely. you know, yep. then you figure out if, uh, yeah. How about that for a title? Social satisfaction. Social. I like social satisfaction. I, I was going to make it more about instructing your audience though, because I think, <laughs> Well, because that's a bigger, like, you know, (laughs) that's, that's actually what this is about. That's the decision you need to make. Do you instruct your audience and how do you instruct your audience? I I will keep social satisfaction as a potential song title though, if that's okay with you. Oh, it's, I I think uh, it would be, it would be a great song title. Yeah. Yeah. I can't get no. That's correct. That's correct. That's, that's, that's been, that's been proven over and over again the last, last, well, you know, few decades. So there you go. Yep. Uh, Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, man. Uh, So it's interesting. Let us know what you think. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. uh, uh, What you're doing with your bands, what you want to do, what you've been thinking about, what you're choosing not to do. That would be, it would be helpful. Quite frankly, you know, selfishly, I would love to, to hear all of that feedback because I'm struggling with this and uh, trying to figure out the, the right way to do this, to make both me and, you know, the band and our audience um, comfortable as we move forward. Because 
Outdoor gigs are one thing. Indoor gigs are another thing. And I can't, I canceled both of our upcoming indoor gigs. Interesting. Yeah. We don't, I don't think we have any indoor gigs on the books. Although this barn gig on Saturday, technically indoors, big barn, but it is, you know, four walls and a ceiling. So, um, so we do have that. And yeah, it wouldn't surprise me though, if I come back on gig gab on Monday uh, next week uh, and tell you that this gig was nixed because, you know, people got too concerned about, you know, COVID and all that stuff. Uh, yep. That it, it, you know, it, it's, I, I could see it going either way. Um, yep. Yep. So we had one last question. Uh, we actually, we've had, uh, we have a lot more questions, but we're only going to get to two of them today. So um, this one I will, I will say comes from Mr. X and, you know, I had it all up on my thing and now I have no idea where it is, Paul. Why I can't. I f- oh yeah. There's my mailbox with all the great stuff. Uh, yes. Right. So uh, Mr. X writes in and says, looking for some advice. We have an older gentleman that plays bass in our band and has been with us for over two years, but he is now in the middle of early onset dementia. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and declining very quickly. He has his good days and bad, but is no longer consistent with his playing. He's a very cool guy and we love him deeply but we know he's holding us back. We're lamenting over letting him go and trying to figure out the least evasive way to do it. If you've had any kind of experience with this sort of thing or have any advice, we would love to hear it. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, this, um, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm trying to think I've played off my, most of my life. I have had the great fortune of playing with people that are older than me. And I, I've loved that because they tend to have, lot everybody that i've played with has 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 taught me things but um but playing with people who are more seasoned is is even you know icing on the cake but i don't think i've ever run into this kind of scenario i've run into people that say ah oh, you know i'm too old to be carting equipment around anymore i don't want to play as much like i've seen that for sure but i have not seen you know truly this kind of health you know so let me let me try this yeah go you know i i have uh, I have two guys under 50 in my band, uh, and I would say two or three guys over 60 in my band. Wow. All right. Yeah, I think. And, sure. you know, I've had this, the philosophical discussion about this and, you know, here's the thing. Most of the guys in my band have, you know, almost 20 years of tenure in my band. Right. So, you know, Mr. X has two years is a little bit different, but I would, my reaction to the question is, if your band is a business, I guess you have to take care of business. If your band is a social, you know, a collection sure. of friends, yeah. I think you nurture that along, you know, for a while. But I do think it's actually reasonable to start the conversation and be like, hey man, you know, it it's, it's getting a little tough. You know, can we have an honest conversation about where you are? And I think that that's a bro thing, actually. I think that's a loving thing if you do it right. Yep. If you just fire the guy tomorrow, that's wrong, that's right? Wrong. Yeah, again, yeah. If, it, if it's a business, then, then you, you know, it's an employee thing and, you know, you make that decision. But if it's a, if your group is a bro thing or even a hybrid of a bro and a business thing or a cis, I guess, you know, I use the term bro, not, yes. not inflammatory, right? Yeah, but friend, I do think, a friend's thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my position with the house rockers is no, nobody gets fired from the house rockers for a, a, a non intentional series of events. Sure. Some, you know, if some guy doesn't practice, you know, something or doesn't come prepared or is late or, you know, that type of stuff, we nurse him that kind of thing back to health. Yep. But if a guy, you know, the only thing I would get you fired if you're actively trying to hurt the band, if you're, if you're, if you're actively trying to hurt the band, that, I understand, yeah. that would be the only thing that I would move someone. So we're, we're a bit of a hybrid. We definitely, you know, guys depend on it, on the money of it, but you know, this amount of time in 20 years, you, you're not going to get, you're not going to get fired for your chops falling off, for example. And you know, that it has been tempting to have a, a conversation with someone about something like that in the past, but, it, but I came to the ethical decision that, um, you know, people have given their heart and soul to make this a good thing and they all have their individual fans. In the case of something that is, that is deeper, like dementia, I do think if it's a bro thing, it is a loving thing to have the conversation and say, hey man, you know, maybe even tape a show or something like that and, you know, kind of 
share back, you know, and I don't know when someone is entering stages of dimension, do they have any awareness to other people around them? Maybe bring it up or they, yeah. you know, is it possible that they're, you know, getting some, getting some care already, but I, that, that's the way I would draw the line. If, you know, if you're a, a, a wedding band or a, you know, a corporate band and, you know, everybody's income depends on this. It, it to me, it's kind of a, you know, you still do it humanely, but you know, you kind of have to take care of business. But like most people who listen to us, I would think there's a, there's kind of a hybrid mix of things. And I think the humane thing is to try and nurture someone and prepare them that, that, you know, to get to the end of their performing career. And uh, if that's what it's going to be, find a way to honor their contribution, you know, sit-ins or whatever it might be from time to time. But, you know, it's also not fair to the other people in your band if, if your band is going down. And maybe maybe where you start is is everybody in the band on the same page yeah, about it. That's I mean, a, yeah, it sounds, I mean, if, that's a great place to start. It sounds like maybe they are in this particular scenario. Um, but I think that's the, the first thing to do is say, okay, is it just me? Am, am I reading more into this than, than any of the rest of you are, it, you know, let's talk through that because it might, it, you know, it, whatever the reason is, I think this one is probably pretty clear, but you know, it might be like, Oh, I, you know, this, whatever this person's doing or whatever's happening to this person is driving me crazy. Maybe somebody can talk you off the ledge, right? <laughs> like that, that yeah. can happen, but yeah, you know, have that talk. Is this negatively affecting the entire band in, in a way that is um, unfixable, and in this case, you know, you're not like, unless you've got some magic in the band, you're not going to fix some yeah. dementia. Right. So, you you know, you, but then, you know, I would, in a scenario like this, I would involve if the person has a, a you know, a partner or spouse or a family member, so, you know, figure out who is caring for them and, and have them at least somehow involved in, mm. in the, this conversation, maybe not present for it because th that may not seem appropriate to, to, you know, to your band, uh, but making them aware that, look, we're, we're going to deliver this news to this person and, uh -huh. and, you know, a handoff of sorts so that, you know, you know, you need to know that you're going to need to support this person that's about to receive a blow. Some bad news. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, there's no one answer because no. you know, there's a, there's 500 different, you know, variables that can go into this. That's right. Yeah. But you're, you know, holding up to the light, like how would, how would you feel, you know, right. and how would you want to be treated? Like, you know, and again, if, if it was me, I would want to know if I was hurting the band and I would, I, that would be the thing I wouldn't want to do, but some other people they you know, they just wouldn't be able to see that. And, sure. and if, and if this guy is one of those guys who just literally won't hear it, then you're going to have to, you know, you got to figure out how far the bro rope goes and you know, how, how far you can, sure. you can nurse this along. But you know, again, if it's, if it's dollars and cents, I think it's a, it's, it's to some degree easier, but if, if it is like so many people who, you know, my situation, many of your situations, you got to kind of take into account, you know, will, will the spouse be supportive or significant other be supportive of it? Yeah. Will the person be receptive to it? You know, are, is your band on the same page about all this type of stuff? Is there a ramp? How bad is it? You know, how long right. can you live with it? Right. Right. So, you know, I, I, I think you kind of got to pro and con your approach to things and just kind of give yourself some ramp, you know, to, you know, You'd like to, you'd like it to end so everybody feels as good as possible about it. It may not be possible. So but, everybody you know. feels respected. I mean, I think that's yeah. the right. That's the goal here. Is and and I, if it were, if it were me, and, and the scenario is sort of as I've been painting, and you know, we involved wh whoever their family member or whatever that was going to care for them. Uh, I would, you know, at, as the conversation was wrapping up, I would tell them, hey, by the way, you know. Uh, Tim knows about this, you know, we told Tim that you were going to be, you know, we were going to be delivering this news to you because we wanted Tim to, to be able to support you. So Tim already knows, uh, Tim doesn't know any specifics about what happened in this conversation because Tim's not here for this conversation, but Tim is there to support you. And, and then, you know, truly kind of have that handoff so that, so that when, when, you know, this bass player gets home and tells Tim, the band fired me and Tim says, yeah, I know he doesn't feel betrayed. Right. You know, it's like, yeah. Oh, you, you, you know, there's, we're not keeping any secrets here. 
we thought about this. We respect you. We wanted you to have support after we walk away from you, which is effectively what's happening. Or maybe you're not walking away, right? Maybe you're still friends after the, after the fact, you're just not playing in a band together. You know, Sid Barrett certainly uh, lived that role for a long time. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's a well-paved path. So, you, you know, and, and that's worth considering is like, are you never going to interact with this person again? Is this goodbye forever? Or is this, right. you're no longer our bass player, but you're still one of us. Well, you know. I can, I can give firsthand experience of that. So when, when we had to replace Joe, our drummer, right? Yeah. So Joe is my musical soulmate. We like the same bands. We like the same music. We like the same clothes as the song says. And, um, you know, Joe was having, he was he was frustrated that like we had a really hot summer and him schlepping his drums, setting him up, playing a gig in the heat. You know, it took its toll on him. He actually went to the hospital from dehydration. That's bad. It was bad. And so we had a conversation. Is it time? And as emotional and heart wrenching as that conversation was, it was a you know, we hugged each other and we, you know, we, we, we talked about it. And again, Joe was my guy, yeah. and, uh, is my guy. And, um, I, I wasn't, you know, he wasn't the founding drummer of the house rockers, but he might as well have been, he'd been with me almost from the beginning and I love him so much. It was, it was as hard on me as it was on him and on everybody. Cause he was, you know, it was just this great personality that people associated with the band. So, the little things that you can do to, to exit with respect. You know, I wrote a really long tribute to him and thanking him for his contribution, making the band what it is, you know, did a little pictorial of him. Yeah. You know, we did a, uh, uh, the last gig we turned into a party. Him, he's another Springsteen fan. And, and one of the last songs that we did together was born to run. And there was not a dry eye on the stage. And those who knew us who were in the audience, you know, were in that moment together. Yeah. And I think Joe, you know, I, 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 I would believe that Joe felt because he, he took his role as a drummer very seriously. I mean, he yes, was he a, he, yeah. his identity as a musician was a very is a very important part. And um, I was determined to end this chapter with as much dignity, respect and appreciation was is a very big part of it um, as possible. And I feel good. I miss him every day. Um, he's not dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was like, I, I miss him in the band every day. Yeah, of course. But, um, you know, we replaced him with someone that he felt good about. He had a little bit of a voice into that decision. And so it, there was a transition and, you know, again, you say you play with older people. I play with some older people. There's, you know, a lot of classic rock bands are going to be older people. If you're playing music from the seventies now, that music is 50 years old, buddy. So, you know, <laughs> please, please don't remind me. I have a birthday. Yeah, coming up. <laughs> there you go. So, um, you know, this is a very, very useful discussion because, you know, what constitutes when someone's at the end of the line in your band is something that you think about. I mean, you kind of like want to ignore it and hope it never comes, but it's right. coming. It's coming it, for all it, of us. Well, it, 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 in some way, shape or form, it happens, right? You know, and so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an interesting subject. I, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the question. Hopefully we, hopefully we gave you some, something that's helpful, but, uh, or at, at least it certainly, this was helpful for me, but you know, hopefully helpful for other people too. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's what I got for today, man. You got anything else? Nope. This was, uh, we went into the mailbag was kind of cool. So yeah, I like thanks. It. Thanks everybody. We actually have quite a few yeah. queued up for more discussions. But yeah. It's overflowing. So we will, we will dig deeper next week. So, yep. Yeah. Cool. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us. Thanks for, uh, staying subscribed, giggabpodcast.com and, uh, make sure to check out Banzoogle, that code giggab, 15% off your first year. It's good. And and always be performing. You were pretty much the whole time I saw you. You were living the dream. <laughs> <laughs>